As you heard, my name is Christian. Uh, currently, I'm working as a software engineer in the Qt company, which is one of the companies that support the Qt project. Maybe you heard about it. Later, I will have one slide to explain the motivation behind this talk and why I'm talking about C++ and Python. So first of all, uh, don't worry about the examples or the slides or whatever. Just go to that GitHub repository. There is a link to the slides, and you can get all the source code. It's, oh my god, I feel like a star. Like everyone taking pictures of it. Like, stop it. <laughs> As you can check it out. I mean, at the end of the talk, also is my GitHub username, so you can check it out. It's called Unleash CVP. <clears throat> OK, so first of all, uh, the Qt project in general is a C++ framework, huge framework. And uh, with starting to do some Python stuff, you need to have the mandatory comparison between the two languages. First of all, uh, of all we know that uh, both languages are general purpose. That also, you have multi-paradigm. You can do many things with them. And then we start to notice some difference that may, I'm pretty sure that most of you are aware of. Dynamically type, statically type, compile, interpret, and then memory management, and about also code reliability. So I know this is kind of a, if we have, just raise your hand, who is currently writing C or C++ code? OK, good. So I, I felt your pain, too. So um, I know that sometimes C++ could be complicated, but it's just want to show you that it's not, and you can even make things in Python better. So first of all, Everyone knows that Python is beautiful. I remember the first time that I typed that on, on a console when I was studying computer science, and I was, wow, everything works. But if you think about it, I mean, C++ is not so different, right? I mean, you can write something that maybe you need to run an external compiler or something, but you achieve the same thing, right? So OK, after all, C++ is simple. It's not. Because then you have things like metaprogramming, and you start, uh, you know, templates over templates. Over, and this is one of the reasons that people get scared of C++. But C++ is not so ugly. And this is some extreme cases of people with a lot of time, that, a lot of effort, and try to do these complicated things, like a compile time if. But uh, let's go about one of the goodies, uh, a couple of goodies that uh, C++ and the latest standards being 11 on. Has. I mean, if you're familiar with C or C++, now there is this amazing uh, auto type that kind of detects the variable that you have, which is kind of a similar, like a more dynamic language, but not. Uh, you can even use uh, uh, some functions to, to get the declarative time of a different variable to, de to declare another one and stuff. And then again, we have the for loops that with the time it has been improved. I mean, this is kind of the more dumb old version that we have in C++ to kind of like go in a vector. I know that you can do also with an iterator too, but it's kind of like going element by element, but it's too complicated. So then you can do more fancy things like this. And if you remember the author one, then you can kind of go like, which is not so complicated to understand. Also, if you're a fan of Python lambdas, you can now so also do it in C++ with the latest standards and so on and so forth. And you can have this for each man handling a nice lambda there to just summing up some values. Uh, but the most interesting things about uh, C++ are coming, in my opinion, in C++ 20, which is, I don't know, I have this relationship with love and hate with C++ 20. There are some things that are really nice and some things that I have no idea why people is doing it. But one of the things that I like is this one. So you have this uh, amount, uh, sorry, this type of ranges that you can use now. And if you see the four, the kind of like the type of the four there, it's kind of similar that can you, you can have there. So after all, I mean, it's not so crazy different, right? The same with a more example. I mean, I know that the smart way maybe is the first line that is commented out, but you can write the function maybe like the second line that you see there, which is also quite similar to what you can achieve in C20. So after all, I mean, it's just adding some semicolons at the end, right? So the idea is that now it's not about like which language is best, but how to make both languages to, to improve each other and try to collaborate in a more um, efficient way. So I want to propose now a new language that is called, no, no, it's not. But I'll just talk to uh, extending Python with C++. And for this, uh, we will go through a couple of examples, really simple ones. Um, and the first of all, oh, who here didn't know before the conference that Python was written in C? We had some? OK, we had some people. OK. So this is something that also was kind of shocking to me because I thought that it was some black magic assembly stuff, but it was written in C. So if you learn some C, you could understand it. And then you could understand other things, like this joke, for example. I know that is really bad, but uh, it's, it's the only joke that I have on the slides. But So I'm really sorry, but I needed to do it. So let's 
take a look at how we can create an amazing module based in uh, pure C Python. And let, okay, let's go for it. So the first thing that you need to know is that you just need to see a C file. And we will go through these examples with a, the most simple thing that I could think that it was a hello world function that just returns the char star or string or whatever. So I hope that everyone can read. Uh, if, C, if you don't know C or C++, it's kind of that you get the idea. It's kind of a function declaration that returns some message, which is hello, Euro Python 2019. Okay? So for building a C++, I will just sum out. Don't be aware. Don't be afraid. Just to show you. So th that's all the code that we require to create a new Python module written in C Python, which one function that is just printing hello world. It's not so scary, right? I mean, I need to confess, the first time that I started to play around with this, I was just copying all this weird structure that you have around, that all these wires are like null, null, zero, and other things. You just copy some stuff and it works. So if you are brave enough after this talk, just go to the C Python directory and play with it, and maybe you can write other sophisticated models with it. So this is a simple case, right? And this is just one example, one simple function, and we have this. So um, what's the motivation behind this Qt thing? So um, Qt is just a C++ framework that is like huge, and the main, one of the main functionalities was to uh, offer the way of developing user interface, graphical user interfaces for people. And also Qt implements many of the things that we have for free in Python, in C++, which is like a, a lot of abstractions for different classes to interact with uh, more um, uh, for databases or maybe doing command line or scripting alike in C++, and even other advanced things, a different way of creating user interfaces, actions, notification, threats, all these things. So they are providing a lot of goodies to the C++ world, and at some point uh, the project was, but you know what? Uh, we should, I mean, this thing need to be maybe available in other languages. So people started to wonder about Python. So uh, maybe you are aware there is already a set of binding which is really old, it's called PyQt, and this was developed by a different uh, company, uh, some people doing a lot of work there, and this was fantastic. And in the Qt project, they wanted to kind of have an official uh, adop uh, adoption of these things, so they decided, so maybe we can create a new set of bindings and you know, just put it there and see, I mean, it's an open you know, market, so people can decide what to choose. At the moment, they are at the same level. One is really old, and there's a lot of examples and tutorials. But the, at the, the Qt project at that point had a couple of options to do this with this huge C++ framework. So they could raw, uh, write raw C Python, they could raw uh, Swig, I mean maybe you, you heard about Swig, or they could use Boost Python. So if we take a look at the Swig implementation, so with Swig, uh, we just, just for you to believe me, we have here our difficult function to understand and the, the only things that we need to do for the week is just to create an interface. So this interface is in an I file that also nothing really scary or something at the moment. So we have a couple of um, instructions to build it. I mean, you, we, uh, we run Swig and then we compile some stuff and then we can just use a normal, simple import the module and uh, execute it. And then we have the message. Nothing too fancy. With Boost Python, it's kind of a similar uh, story. We go there again, we have this simple CPP file with our function there, and then we just need to define Boost Python module, the name, the namespace, and then we define the function. Nothing too scary at the moment, right? So this was looking at a really, a really nice uh, solution, right? I mean, we were achieving the same thing. But the problem lied that many things that we do in C++ need to be specially treated inside Python. For example, ownership of objects. If you are wrapping an interface or, uh, that is in C++, who owns the objects? Some cases will be Python, some cases will be C++. So you need to deal with all these things. Okay, so the option that uh, at, the, at that time the developer had was, okay, this just one of the generator and we can maybe modify the wrapper uh, generated code. So let's take a look of the code that Swig generates. So just for you to have an idea. So this is kind of the code that generates, and I will start to go down. We are in 2%, 3%. Okay, I will just page down, 4, 5, 7, two. So 
I understand it. It's a little bit too much with this small function, right? So, that, okay, that's over. And uh, there is kind of a motivation to say, okay, I know that they need to set up many things to get for granted and to automate many processes, and it's a really smart solution. But if you want to modify this file, it will be unbearable. I mean, you cannot do it. So there was a lot of motivation behind this uh, C Python and, uh, sorry, and Swig and Boost Python. Uh, Boost, I don't have the source code from the Boost Python here, but the shared library is roughly the same size, so you can imagine that there are a lot of black magic there. So what do you say? Okay, they started the development of this new tool based in, uh, in Boost at the moment, and they said, eh, no, it's too heavy, let's write our own thing. Okay, everything was released properly, then there was the project to continue the development, and the good news was that last year officially was released this new set of bindings of uh, Qt in Python, and then their name of the new project was called Qt for Python. So maybe you heard about this, or PySide 2. It was this, uh, all this story behind. But okay, this is just a story, but what was important, for, to, at least in my opinion? How do we do it? So this tool that you see here in the center, called Jiboken 2, is kind of like the, the response for writing our own um, code generator tool to expose all this huge C++ framework to Python. So there is a module inside that it kind of extracts all the API information from Qt, base, it's based in Clang, of course, if you want to do smart things in C++, you need to use Clang. Uh, then we have a support type system, which is nothing else than an XML file, then, then you get, wait, something is being weird, uh, an XML file where you can define all these things that I told you about ownership or, for example, what do we do if a function has a void star argument in Python? We need to have a special or type or treatment or do some casting or something around. So this tool grabs this type system, the information from the framework and generates some wrapper, that the one that you saw from, from Swig, but of course more reduced and it makes more sense and it's more clean in my opinion. And then with this we can just compile it and have a, the same uh, Python module that we had. So this tool is called Shiboken, the documentation is there and uh, I don't know what is happening, I'm not doing anything and it's, the slides are coming. Okay, so the Japanese kanji doesn't mean anything. If there, we have some Japanese speaker there here, it's just three words that make no sense. But let's take a look of the Shiboken. Okay, so again, uh, we will go first for you to believe me that we have here the implementation and we, we are like cheating a little bit because of course it's, we are working with strings from the standard library. Then we define a complex header for this, which is just that. And uh, for this type system that I just told you, um, it's nothing else than this. So we've had HTML, we said this will be a package called simple, it will have a primitive type, there's a string from standard library, and a hello function. After all the, the, um, the compiling and stuff, we will get something like this. And let's go to build, and it's inside simple, and here you have the module wrapper. I will zoom out, just for you to show that I'm not lying. It's long, but it's not so long as the other one. So here you have it. I, I, don't, I don't expect you to read the code. I just want to show you the magnitude of the code. So at least this is being code gener automatically generated, calling this C++ function, and exposing everything with CPython to, to be able to use it from Python. So it's way shorter than the option that we had. And of course, this uh, translates into having a, a more a lightweight uh, shared libraries, and you can achieve the same things. So there are other nice options out there. And um, for this, uh, I kind of tend to recommend people to take a look of all the solutions that you have out there, because it's unfair to say, yeah, this is the best solution. No, it's not. I mean, there are many things that you can complement to each other. I don't know if you have the chance and, or maybe know one of these ones. The last one, for example, is the one that the other set of binding called PyQt uses, which is called SIP. Uh, PyBind11 also is a really nice project that uh, appear in the um, I think in a couple of years ago, even I think at, uh, two uh, Euro Pythons ago, there was also a talk about uh, PyBind 11. So let's take a look of like, how do you achieve the same things and uh, with the other options? I think that I am good with the time at the moment. So this is the case of PyBind 11. So let's open again the, the file. If you see the motivation here is clearly from Boost Python. I mean, it's again a kind of a macro that kind of defines a module. Then you have the definition of the function, some documentation, and so on and so forth. And then you can do the same thing. I mean, after you compile it and everything, you have your simple, um, 
meaning that you can achieve the same thing. So it's kind of like same idea as Boost Python, but uh, they are doing way more things, and there is a lot of nice support there that I encourage you to, to check it out. CFFI. Well, this is, again, not really fair comparison because CFFI, uh, we had some talks already that we explained about this thing. It's not kind of like um, generating code, but it's just kind of loading something. So we can have, uh, this is the one here. Whoop. This is the code that is being generated, yes. So we go to the simple build, and then you have, you have like inline raw uh, string that contains the function that we want to expose. And then we just compile this thing in some shared library that we can easily load from Python. So if you check, if you check here, for example, the, the main is the same thing that we were seeing in the other examples, just calling this uh, nice function. And in this case, we are casting to string and so on and so forth. But it's kind of the same idea. But again, I mean, it's not like you can write inline code or kind of read lots of C++ code to kind of expose it in this way. The other option that I had there, ah, of course. Uh, C, uh, CFFI is kind of focused on C. Well, I mean, they support C89 and I, I don't remember which one other standard. But uh, for playing with C++, you have a similar idea, which is CPPYY. It's kind of fun, right, CPP. Whatever. And uh, then uh, it's kind of the same idea. So you declare everything like in a string, and then you they have this is a declaration that you can use this from the GBL. Again, same idea and nothing too scary. And the last one is kind of similar. Um, it was a zip that I show you, uh, the one that is using the PyQt uh, bindings. Uh, I will just show you. This is just the. Um, so yeah, here you have the simple. Again, same idea, but the only difference is that they require to define a zip file. And it's nothing like else at this. I mean, it's also it's quite simple. I mean, you just need to define a module, and then you have some include, and then the, the signature of the function. So there are many options out there to achieve the same thing, right? But what's the idea of doing this, right? Um, I have been having some conversation with people sometimes that they say, ah, yeah, but I mean, I use Python for everything. I mean, you don't need C++. And they say, OK, well, what do you use? No, I do everything with NumPy because it's amazing and it's fast and it's Python, you know? And then it's like, yeah, but, you know, it's written in C++. No, no, it's not. So, OK, there's even some people that is not aware that many of the popular libraries out there are using uh, C++ or C. So in this case, you have a, a case of uh, NumPy. I just downloaded the source code. The first line is all the Python files that you have. Uh, that is not test, and then you have the C files there, which is 96, which is still a lot of things that they are doing. And if you want to maybe refer to a more modern module, the case of PyTorch is a little bit more extreme. Then if you look there, we have, uh, no, this is, no, this was, this is wrong. So here, we have 500, 47 C++ files inside the PyTorch because, of course, it's based in Torch and Torch is C++, so everything is C++ inside. So it's kind of a good, a nice motivation of using all these tools to start to write things to improve the Python. We are all here, so if we know C or C++, we kind of, kind of have some responsibility in, your hands, in our hands to improve things. And one of the examples that just out of curiosity, and please don't blame me about the, the, the things that I will show you, is that Simple case, I was helping someone that I was listing some files in Python and uh, getting all, you know, different uh, absolute path. And what do you use there? Glob, right? When you use Glob. Or if you are more like up to date person, you use the path leaf. And then also you have the Glob access there. So for this, um, you know, the deal, I mean, writing uh, Glob is, uh, things are kind of simple. This is a hard-coded thing to just to play with the recursion thing, but you know, import glove, and then you need to double stars there and specify if it's recursive, no. The same way with path leaf is kind of the same idea, right? And um, then I thought, I mean, let's, let's look at the implementation and see if we can kind of do something smarter in C++. So the first thing that came to my mind is that in C++ 17, maybe you know, there is a new adoption in the C++ standard, which is the module called file system. Uh, this is based in the boost file system. So I thought, OK, I will just copy paste the hello world example there, and I will put the file system um, call to list directories. 
So again, same idea, I well just replace the, all the simple and hello, and the only difference is this. If there is any C Python core developer in the audience, please forgive my C Python, but this is just to show how simple we can achieve things. Of course, it's just unsafe. There's memory leaks there because when you append that in, uh, uh, increase the ref counts, and I'm not taking care of anything, but just taking one argument, which is the recursive, to see true or false, and create an empty list and then just doing some dumb appends. So the magic here from the C++ side is that I'm using the file system module, I am using C++17, and there is uh, luckily some directory iterator that you can kind of do recursively or not, and that's it. I mean, if you don't know CPython, you just need to, this is just a function that will take here some arguments, we create an empty list, and then if it's recursive enough, we are appending, well, you know how append works, some stuff, and then we are returning this list. Nothing else. So I thought, okay, let's see how this thing was working. And then I, I wrote a really, really simple uh, bash script because, yeah, I was growing up with bash. And I thought, I will just have this scenario when I have 1,000 directories with 1,000 files inside of each empty files, and I just have to list them. So I just create a shell script to measure this. As you can see here, the glove, the non-recursive option, which is just listing the directories inside this fake environment is 0.05. Uh, I was not expecting Glove to take so long, but I think that it should be something around 20 something seconds. I mean, in the meantime, I can tell you that I was aware, afraid that maybe I was using user bean time and maybe it's not the proper way of doing it. So, okay, there you have it. Recursive 33 seconds. We were talking about all these files. Then I tried a bad leave. Again, it was a little bit more, um, uh, non, uh, it was slower than the Glove file. Then the other case is the recursive way. It will be roughly, I guess, at the same, if I'm not wrong. I should have had this prepared. Okay, there you have it, 20 seconds. And then the fast glove implementation that I have there, it's less than a second. I mean, I know I am not taking care of cache or, you know, the, I don't know, releasing the GL to use parallel computer or something fancy, just the simplest thing that you can think. And then you have it. I mean, it's. And then I thought maybe it's the same thing, I am doing it wrong, so let's do the same performance in, in Python with you know, the time module or something. And after all the tries, it was more or less the same result. And uh, it's not like I want to say, yeah, this should be the new glove, but this is how easy you can improve things there. And if you are thinking in the next NumPy, the, nem the next Pandas, the next PyTorch or something like that, well, I will not wait for the, re the, the results there, but it's roughly the same, believe me. Um, so yeah, this is a summary. It's, it's okay if you cannot read everything because you can check the slides afterwards um, about the version that you can use, the licenses, the compatibility with Python. Here I just want to highlight Shiboken, the, th the thing that I am working with, and also SIP because there is something that is called Stable ABI. Maybe you heard about it? Yes? Yes? Stable ABI? Good. So this is just for developers to release wheels that are compatible with Python 3.5 onwards. And I don't need to have different wheels with different Python versions. So this is really tricky. It's just the way that you create objects are a more dynamic way, but it, it's really hard and it's implemented in those two options. So uh, there you can have information from the PySet project. You can find me here also. You can check the, the my social networks and all the, all the information and the, you can just uh, type make, I add some make files there just for you to know the process of building all these wrappers so you can start playing around today about it. And just as a, a PSA that it's always good to support your local groups. So if you, at any moment you come to Berlin, I mean, we have, I think, one of the most amazing Python communities out there. We have PyLadies, Python Users Berlin, PyBerlin, and PyData Berlin. So that's it. Thank you very much.